read a little bit of this passage and then we'll do what we normally do and ask what question, what strikes you about it. But this is what uh, the text says. These are the generations of Esau, that is Edom. Now, there's something in the Hebrew text that's almost impossible for us to see in English, but um, remember how I said in a Hebrew text that these little dots, that those are extra things? Uh, that's the vowels they were added. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Might help. <laughs> Might help if... Uh, if uh, Uh, something we can see uh, with this Esau and Edom, uh, there's something in Hebrew that's difficult for us to see, but would be very easy for someone to see in, um, in Hebrew. And I want to try to show it to you. Um, so this is 36. Um, Let me just blow this up so we can see it a, a bit. Uh, do you ever feel like you're 10 minutes late to everything? That, that's how I've been today. I've had meetings since uh, 7.30 this morning and uh, uh, no breaks at all. So sorry, I would have had this uh, up. Do you see that this is the word, well, take my word for it, this is the word Edom. Can you see that? Okay. And do you see how these little dots go on and off? Okay, so the dots are the vowels, and they put vowels for people like us reading the language, but if you go to Israel, how it's going to look is like that. That's what a newspaper is. So the dots are kind of a way you know, kind of like training wheels, if you will. Okay, so look at that word Edom. Um, and now look at the word um, look at the word Adam. So that's the word Adam. And this is the word Edom. What can you tell about those two words? They're almost identical. In fact, they are places where they are exactly identical. Uh, the why is this is called a, a mater lectionis, a mother of reading. And that's what they did before they had the dots. Uh, they would put those vowels and say, read an O-class vowel when you get here. Uh, but when it was originally written, it's written consonantally. So when you when you look at Hezekiah's inscription, when you look at the seals, you don't ever have the dots or anything like that. Oh, it's much easier to read with the dots. Much easier. But people who, it's their native language, can read it like that. Uh, it's just people like us who are learning it as a second language. We need the training wheels to. But do you get the idea that Edom and Adam are related? And do you see the kind of parallel in the story that Edom sold his birthright for a meal? Adam sold Eden for a meal. And you start seeing there's some kind of parallel going on with these two stories. We could see that if we were native Hebrew readers, but it, it's hard to connect Edom and Adam because that just seems way different, but it's not very different in Hebrew. Uh, the Esau part of it uh, looks like the word they work or his work or something like that. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, 
O holy Bama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth, Adabor, Esau, uh, Eliphaz, Bas. So all these uh, people, just like Lamech, Esau is intermarrying, took his wives, sons, daughters, all the members of his household, uh, all they acquired in the land of Canaan. He went far away from Jacob. Uh, Esau settled in the hill country of Seir, uh, that is, uh, in Edom. These are the generations, and so it goes through all the um, different ones. We can see that there are many, that they are uh, powerful people, uh, all kinds of rulers come. That's 36. Uh, and then uh, we come to Jacob. So that's all about Esau. What about Jacob? These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. And in Hebrew, it's kind of weird because you can also read it, he was pasturing his brothers. So he was shepherding his brothers. It may be a play on words there. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated it even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf rose up and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed going to rule over us? Are you going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying, in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Now what happened at Shechem? What do we know happened at Shechem? That's where Dinah was raped. That's where Simeon and Levi murder, or however you want to, uh, however you want to think about that. But they take exact. Uh, Massive revenge for the rape of their daughter by killing every single man in the town, taking their wives. So they come to that place. Israel said to Joseph, and if you picked up in the narrative how it's beginning to uh, alternate calling Jacob Israel sometimes, and have you wondered about that? Like, why isn't he just Jacob? Why is he just Israel? Why is it sometimes Jacob, sometimes Israel? Here we see it's Israel. Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers fast, pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send them to you. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now and see if it's well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields and the man asked, What are you seeking? He said, I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they got away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. They saw him from afar. And before he came near, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, 
let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Now, uh, who's killed their brother in this story before this? Cain and Abel. And Cain, Abel is the righteous one. Cain is the proud one. Who else almost kills their brother? Esau almost kills Jacob. Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say a fierce animal has devoured him. We'll see what becomes of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Now, who is Reuben? And uh, he should be the firstborn, right? Does Reuben have a problem? So what's kind of the black mark against Reuben in the story? He slept with Bilhah, Bilhah's father's uh, third, uh, third wife. Let us not take him his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. And he said this, Reuben did, that he might rescue him out of their hand and that he might restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, myrrh on their uh, way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then the Midianite traders passed by they drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And I think in the homework, I had you try to find, and did you find that uh, thing? Is it in numbers where if you accidentally kill someone, it's like what uh, restitution you can make? And you saw that someone who's under 20 years old, that's 20 shekels, right? Uh, so they're giving the going rate for um, someone under 20. Joseph is 17 when this happens. They took Joseph to um, Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? And they took Joseph's robe, and they slaughtered a goat and dipped the blood, uh, the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to the father and said, This we have found. Please identify where, whether or not it's your son's robe. He identified it and said, It's my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. So Jacob is deceived by this clothing. Who else in this story has been deceived by clothing? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, I didn't. I hadn't read that one yet. Yeah, you're right. He's deceived. Uh, that's the next one. But who... Who deceives someone with clothing? Oh, Jacob. Jacob. So Jacob deceived his father, and now Jacob is being deceived. It's like what goes around comes around. Uh, Jacob de pretended to be his brother. We saw how Leah, at least 
apparently was complicit pretending to be her sister. And so somehow all these sins are like, they're not just happening once, they're happening over and over again. What what do you make of that, David? And then at the beginning of the story, um, after he gets loaded, and the animal's murdered, the locusts. And that's God. And that's obviously a good thing. So it's like you're reading these stories and you're trying to put them together and you're saying, I wonder, obviously these stories are connecting somehow, but how are they connecting? Um, Jacob tore his garments, put sackcloth on his loin, mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, no, I will go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Now, if we had time and we could read all the stories, we would read uh, in 39 uh, the purity of Joseph's life. Even though all these horrible things happen, even though Potiphar's wife is trying to force herself uh, uh Joseph is saying, how can I sin against God and do this thing? I'm not going to do. So uh, Joseph is sexually pure. Um, and even though uh, people have turned against him, he's sexually pure. He's walking with God. And notice that that story is introduced here at the end of 37, but it's picked up at 39. And in the middle, we're going to have chapter 38. So what's chapter 38 about? Judah. And is Judah sexually pure? No. So what can you tell me about 38? Like what's going on in uh, chapter 38? So do you see the literary device where you're, you've introduced the purity of Joseph, you're going to pick up the purity of Joseph, but now in the middle we're going to have this story about Judah. Yeah. And thinking about the fact that he was just from Judah's line. And yes. Like, and how just totally messed up his whole family was. And that I, it seems very, like a very specific choice to not make that he was from Joseph's line. Right. If you were just picking someone to be the firstborn, you you would pick Joseph, would you not? I mean, he's the one who worships God. He's the one who... Uh, Why is he still the first? I mean, apparently they're treating Judah as the firstborn. He's the one that the king is going to come from. We're going to see in 49 when the blessings are given out, he gets this massive blessing. And so you kind of understand why uh, they're passing over Reuben. And even Simeon, Simeon and Levi, the whole Shechem incident, uh, and Jacob mentions that in the blessing, but you come to Judah and you wonder why is Judah being blessed when you compare his life to Jacob, uh, Joseph's life? Joseph seems the much more uh, prone to be blessed. Well, let's just look at this story, read the details of it, and uh, I want to point out a couple of things uh, uh, to you. It happened at that time, Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite. Now, if we track this down, the Adulamites are Canaanites. Are Canaanites good things or bad thing? Uh, so how do you know they're bad? Right, the whole Canaanite fertility cult that we've seen uh, prone to sexual sin. We don't know what was going on in that Noah story, but Canaan is the one who gets blessed or gets cursed. Then all the ones from Canaan, the 
Hittites, the Gergeshites, that long list, that's the same list that Israel is to exterminate later. And here we have Judah and his friends with an Edomite. Now, if we step back and did a whole Bible biblical theology, uh, one of the Psalms that David writes is in the cave of the Adulamites. So even all those years later, they're remembering this uh, story and this man. So he turned the tide to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hera. And Judah saw a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. Uh, he took her and went into her. And the uh, whole Bible, biblical theology, intermarrying with Canaanites, good thing or bad thing? Bad thing. Took her and went into her. That's usually the idiom for rape. In Now, this woman is called a wife later, so we don't know if, like, he's marrying her or if this is an affair that turned to a marriage. We don't know. It's just odd language. Uh, he took her and went into her. She conceived and bore a son and called his name Ur. She conceived and bore a son and she called his name Onan. Yet again, she bore a son and called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chesiv when she born. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn son, and her name was Tamar. Now, we're not told what her ethnicity is. Um, most people are assuming that she's a Canaanite. He's living among the Canaanites. It seems a pretty fair assumption. We're not told. Uh, her name means the date palm or something like that. But he takes this woman, uh, perhaps a Canaanite, but... Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And do you remember when we did the Noah story? And we talked about how uh, Noah found grace in God's eyes. Do you remember how we talked about this? Okay. So this is the word for Ur. And this is the word for wicked. So what do you notice about that? Ur was wicked in God's eyes. It's the same thing, right? So it's a play. Wicked and Ur are somehow, uh, it's, it's some kind of play on words. Some, and perhaps... Uh, kind of contrasting Noah finding grace, Ur being wicked. Uh, he was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Now, how many people, wicked people, have we run across in this story? A lot. And how many of those are so wicked that God kills them right like that? So what does that tell you about these boys? They must be pretty bad. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your wife's, into your brother's wife, and perform the duty of a brother in law to her, and raise up offspring for a brother. Now, this practice is what's known in the later Pentateuch as called leveret marriage. Uh, Levere, I think, means something like brother-in-law. And uh, if, you, if you have a brother that dies and his widow is childless, then a living brother is to um, give this woman offspring. And that seems a very strange practice to us. We're not told in Scripture why. God uh, instituted that law. Uh, I've wondered if it's some kind of welfare thing where this widow woman will have someone to 
uh, care for her in her old age and that uh, God set up a, a way to provide that. Uh, the text doesn't really tell us. We don't know. We're just told that's the law. And we know that whatever children uh, a person has from that process, those children are the children of the dead brother, not the children of the brother-in-law. So when it comes to inheritance, children from a leveret marriage inherit based on the dead brother. Uh, that's the law in the rest of the Pentateuch. Whatever is going on, this is what happened. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste his semen on the ground so as not to give offspring um, to his brother. What he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death too. So you heard the words uh, uh, in English, uh, what he did is even called onanism. That, that's uh, we actually have a English word for uh, that uh, from this story. Uh, it was wicked. So if God designed it so that this woman would have offspring, Onan was perfectly happy sleeping with her over and over and over, but he was not ever going to give her children out of it, and it. Uh, was wicked and God killed him. So you're Judah and Ur's dead slept with uh, Tamar, Ur's dead. Uh, Onan sleeps with um, Tamar, Onan's dead. There are two conclusions you could draw. <laughs> One is I've been a wicked person and raised wicked sons, and God's judging my wicked sons. That would be one conclusion you would draw. What would the other conclusion be? There's something wrong with this woman. She's killing all my boys, right? And which one does Judah conclude? He concludes that there's something wrong with her. So this is what he does. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house. Now you would think, if this woman was married to two of his boys, you would think Judah would say what? Stay in my house. Look, I'll care for you. Uh, it's only right. But he says, go back to your father's house and do it till Sheila, my son, grows up. And then it tells us, for he feared he would die like his brother. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, so she, she is called a wife here, uh, she died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shears, and he is his friend here, the Adulamite. And this Adulamite is a Canaanite. Now, we're not told what he was like, but we do know what the rest of the Canaanites were like. Are they... Pure people or impure people? They're usually impure people. And so you come to this and you wonder, okay, is this a good friendship or is this bad friendship? Uh, it says this, when Tamar was told your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance of Enaim, that means the twofold wells, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that she was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute. So um, in Hebrew, there are two words for prostitute. Uh, so the normal word for prostitute is this one right here, a zonah. So this is someone who 
commits uh, sexual sin, who traffics uh, in sex uh, for money. And that's what he thought she was because she was covered her face. Evidently, that's what prostitutes did. He turned aside to her at the roadhouse and said, come, let me come into you. And did you pick up that's that same idiom that was the uh, when he goes into uh, uh, Shua, uh, the daughter of Shua, at the beginning, let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me uh, that you may come into me? And he said, I will give you a goat from the flock. That seems kind of strange. It seems a little trivial, but that's what he said. She said, if you give me a pledge until you send it, he said, well, what pledge do you want? She replied, your signet, your cord, your staffs in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose, went away, taking off her veil, and put on the garments of her widowhood. Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand. He did not find her, and he asked the men of the place, where is, and did you notice this when you read it, the cult prostitute? Okay, so remember how I said there are two words for prostitute? So this word um, uh, in the text is this word kadosh? Have you ever heard like um, uh, kodesh, uh, the holy of holies? That that's the word. But this is clearly someone who is using uh, sex in the worship of other gods. So this isn't just like a generic. This is like a fertility cult prostitute. So what does that tell you about Judah? Like, she's dressed up like a fertility cult prostitute. It doesn't sound like she was trying to. It sounded like she was like getting ready for she I had not thought of it. I took it the other way. I took it that she's... And I thought maybe she was afraid of Judah because she had heard about his past wife who was just great, you know, in the marrying her, you know? And we don't know. We don't know how to read it. These are the words, the, you know, these are the... But clearly, when he sends to pay the bill, Hera thinks that she isn't just a prostitute, he thinks she's a holy prostitute. So he asked, where's the cult prostitute? And they said, there isn't a cult prostitute here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also, the men of the place said, there's no cult prostitute. So clearly he's relating to Judah. I tried to pay your bill to this cult prostitute and she wasn't there. And Judah said, let her keep the things uh, we'll be laughed at. I sent the goat. I sent the goat. I'm an honest person. I, I said I would send the goat. I sent the goat. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, Tamar your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Um, in Hebrew it says, Tamar your daughter has been a whore. A, a zona, a zana, right? You see our prostitute word there? Tamar your daughter-in-law has been a whore. And moreover, she has conceived a child out of her zenunim. Can you hear the word whoredoms in there? 
your daughter-in-law has been a whore, and out of her whorish over and over actions, she's conceived a, a child. And Judah said, bring her out and burn her. Now, I know the later Levitical laws haven't been written yet, but somehow these earlier stories are somehow interacting with those. We hear that about the Leverett marriage. That wasn't uh, written till later, but somehow those are in play. What's the normal thing that happens to somebody who is immoral? In Leviticus, what do you do to them? Stone them. But there's one exception. There's one woman who whom you burn uh, if they're immoral in the later Levitical law. Um, it's the high priest's daughter. Um, uh, how would I find that? I would ask you to take my word for it, but what do I say over and over in this class? Don't believe anything if you, if I can't show it to you from Scripture. Uh, yeah, here it is. If the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by whoring, she'll be burned with fire. So help me. Why does Judah think that Tamar needs to be burned? He sees himself as a really religious person. <laughs> what do you make of that? What do you want to say to Judah? I mean, isn't it kind of like, look, I teach Sunday school and I'm a deacon and we just can't have these whores running a burner. Uh, that's, that's bad to have. And what do you want to say to Jacob? We were all murdered when we thought she was a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> Judah wants her burned to make her a public example. And what's he totally, like, forcing out of his mind? He's doing the deed not just with a prostitute. He's with a cult prostitute worshiping pagan religion, using sex to do that. And this is why I think she had planned this. And... I used to say if there's a YouTube in heaven, I kind of wanted to watch. And then I thought, you know, we've all got our baggage and we probably don't want YouTubes in heaven at all. Uh, so it's probably not there. But th if there were there, this would be funny because as they're dragging her out, uh, she says, the man, by this man to whom these belong, I'm pregnant. And she said, see if you can tell who they are. It's a ring. It's a staff. Uh, it's a cord. And Judah identified them and said, she's more righteous than I am. He said, since I did not give her my son, Sheila, and he did not know her again. So, one minute left. What do you suppose the purpose of that story is? And this is the whole question. Does God show grace? Does God save people because they're good? Or is there something else going on in the story? 
there's definitely something else going on in this story. If Tamar is a Canaanite, that makes all the offspring half Canaanite, right? If they're not Canaanite, what did we read in Leviticus 18 on Wednesday? What happens to a man who sleeps with his daughter-in-law? What do you do to both of them? Stone. All the people in the descendant, in the line of Judah, are perhaps twofold against half Canaanites and illegitimate children and throw in hypocrisy uh, in there. And yet, God is so merciful and God is so graceful gracious that he does not give Judah what he deserves. He gives Judah grace. And that's where we'll pick it up on Monday.